coming up. We are greeted by a rough sea. Lassos the pollard like a pro. At sea, such details can have huge consequences. The free, yes, free electric bike hiring service. Stunning rock arch is one of the highlights on the island. Nine, nine and a half knots over ground now. Quite a standing wave in there. That's crazy Catherine. It is older than Stonehenge to use the site for a wee tank driving exercise to content herself with a view on a dusty digging site. Pan pan, pan pan, pan pan. We have a problem with our external camera microphone. What started with a small outage in episode 39 has now developed into a major problem and large parts of our audio recording are just a cracking noise. It doesn't help that at the time of recording we are blissfully ignorant of the issue. So apologies for the poor live sound and bear with us through a lot of voiceovers. Today it is time for the three remaining boats in the North Harbour of Fair Isle to say goodbye to a good company and to this stunning island. Fair Isle, you have gained a special place in our heart. We heard from Sequin, the boat that left yesterday that they encountered orcas who hunted a pod of Rizzo's dolphins. Hopefully we'll see some wildlife too. As we exit the harbour, we are greeted by a rough sea, whipped up by a strong tide and a stiff northerly wind. This poses a bit of a challenge for the three boats, particularly for the single-handed wee boat Rase. She almost gets swept to the west side of the island. But as soon as we are a bit more south and out of the tide, the waves become smaller and we set the sails for a wonderful day of sailing. The forecast is a force 4 from north northeast, and our destination for the day is Whitehall Harbour on the island of Stronsay, which is part of the Orkneys. Today's voyage is about 45 nautical miles, which we should make in about 6 to 7 hours. We don't have a courtesy flag for the Orkneys yet, so the Scottish St Andrews Cross has to do the job. Sorry dear Arcadians, we will of course correct this mistake as soon as we can get our hands on one. We decided to steer towards Whitehall Harbour, which has a ferry pier. The northerly wind is expected to increase tomorrow, and on the chart as well from the pilot book, this harbour looks reasonably sheltered, with the small island of Papa Stronze acting as a wind and wave breaker. We make fast on the ferry pier in Whitehall. The wind blows us off the pier, making this docking manoeuvre a wee tricky. Able sea woman, deckhand Catherine, lassoes the pollard like a pro, and soon we lay safely along the wall. Welcome to Orkney Islands. The tidal range in Whitehall is about two meters today, and the wind will back to north northwest and blow us onto the rough wall of the pier with protruding boulders. To further protect Polaris hull, we stick a fender board between the fenders and the wall. Someone once told me that the Shetlander is a fisherman with a farm, whereas an Orcadian is a farmer with a boat. Well, 
There seems to be some truth in it. As we prepare to leave Polaris for the day, we noticed that the chase protector for the docking line had moved and needed to be repositioned. At sea, such details can have huge consequences. Our lines will be under considerable tension and to protect them from chafe on the edge of the pier, we protect them with short pieces of 25 mm hose pipe. It is Monday, 11.30 in the morning and today we will explore the island by bike. Well, the night was not exactly as we had expected from our research. The northerly wind kicked up some small and steep wavelets, constantly slapping on Polaris stern, granting an uncomfortable sleep. The harbour office looks deserted, but anyway, docking on the pier is free of charge. But there are no facilities, except the toilets in the ferry terminal. We found out that the local shop here in Whitehall offers a free, yes, free electric bike hiring service. That's very special indeed, and so we keenly take the offer to explore the island by bike. But there is no other way to explore this small island other than on your own means. There is no public transport here. Travelling to the island is either done by ferry or by aeroplane, but there seems to be no regular flight schedule. There is a rich agricultural heritage here and the island's fishing fleet sustainably catches shellfish in the clear and cold local waters. This tiny island is the permanent home to about 350 people, but nevertheless it is the seventh largest island of the Orkneys. It is home to beautiful beaches, wild cliffs, green fertile fields and miles of coastline. Its highest elevation is just 44 meters above sea level making it very exposed to the sometimes ferocious winds up here. As we stop to check the map, a chap pulls his car over and asks if we need some help. We have a nice chat with him, and it turns out that he moved up here from England to enjoy the peace and quiet after retiring, and he bought a small farm to fulfill his lifetime dream. With our cultural background, we are often surprised about the mobility of people also in the advanced stage. Our excursion leads us to the Vat of Kerbister. This stunning rock arch is one of the highlights on the island. It formed when the roof of a large sea cave collapsed. Indeed, there are many sea caves on this part of Stronsey's coast. Stronsey, like most of the Orkneys, is made from old red sandstone, which provides a fertile soil for agriculture. So, no wonder that farming is such a major activity here. The wind blows with force 4 to 5 and in the shelter of the many islands the water is flat. 
beautiful sailing conditions and we have to be careful not to be too early at the tidal gate at Goldness, at the north edge of the island of Chapinzay. There is a narrow and shallow channel called Vasa Sound, close in along the shore of Chapinzay, with strong tidal currents and we need the tide with us. As we close in towards the gap between Vasa Point and the scary of Vasa, our nerves get tense. To get the current at its minimum, we have to pass the gap at low water. And today at low water, the least depth in the channel will be 10.5 meters, shallowing quickly on both sides. The navigable channel is just about 80 meters wide. We hold our course on a transit with the spire of Kirkwall Cathedral, just in line with the southwest headland of Chapinzay. It is Saturday, the 29th of July, 10 a.m. We just left the marina here in Kirkwall on the Orkneys and we are on our way to Stromnes. The route takes us between the island through Einhalo Sound and then around Orkney mainland into Stromnes. This is not a long distance. The bus takes about 20 minutes from Kirkwall to Stromnes. We're going to have about six hours by boat. There have been sightings of dolphins and some whales today. Maybe we are lucky to meet them today. There is not a lot of wind. We have about eight knots through wind that gives us an apparent wind of about four knots to sail with. It's just not enough to make any way. There are some optimists over there. They have all the sails up and they have the tide with them. So hopefully they will enjoy their trip up north. We have preferred to go. We need to go through two tidal gates today. So bobbing around is no way. We're now that's uh, the piece of water between the island here, Einhalo Island and uh, Orkney mainland. And in between, uh, the pilot book writes about a race. And actually through my binoculars, I can see it. There's uh, quite a standing wave in there. And uh, it's got to be interesting. Catherine, you need to take pictures of that. Um, it's just a very short one as it looks, but there might be some bumpy. Might be a bit bumpy. Okay. Probably the best of conditions you can have going through here. We are close to Neeps, we're two days after Neeps, so the stream is not too big, although I recorded three knots of tide pushing us through or pulling us through. And uh, there's no wind and no swell, so nothing that would aggravate any. Uh, any race and still we see we see it being that wild in here so in, try to imagine how it is in the uh, when situation uh, when the circumstances are not that good with the swell against the wind and a big tide you can't go through here probably we are just going back on course after having been digressed a bit by the race and naturally Right in the middle of the race, right underneath the waves, there are some lobster pots. I really don't want to hit these here.
whales. Unfortunately, we did not spot any dolphins or whales. This was an interesting trip through some challenging stretches of water. Good afternoon, sir. Um, we have just entered the harbour limit over. RS Helvetica, BTS, CSC, come in there. A harbour limit in the Hoi Sound. At present, there's no reported traffic. If you call Stromness Harbour on channel 14, as you might get a approach of it. Yes, that's copied. We will call the harbour and we'll stay by on 11 and 14. Flies out. As quite usual in Scotland, there are no buses running on Sundays, and we were lucky to get our hands on two rental bikes late on Saturday evening to explore the geologic and historic sites between Stromness and Kirkwall today. Today is Sunday, the 30th of July, and it's a beautiful warm and sunny day here on the Orkneys. It's one of the few days warm enough even for us to wear shorts. We take you on a walk along the red sandstone cliffs in Yesnaby. The old red sandstone formation is an assemblage of rocks in the North Atlantic region largely of Devonian age, some 400 million years old. Yesterday, we sailed all along this coast from Kirkwall to Stromness and we enjoyed this stunning rough scenery from the water. We stop at this stunning natural rock bridge that connects a sea stack to the mainland like a lifting bridge. And Catherine dares to test its stability. That's crazy Catherine. I have wobbly legs just from watching her. To me, this seems like tempting fate. A short walk further south is Yesnaby Castle, with a rock arch making this sea stack standing on two fragile legs. And suddenly, the scenery now changes with fog creeping in from the water. Our next stop is the stone-built Neolithic settlement of Scarabray a UNESCO World Cultural Heritage Site. It is older than Stonehenge and the Great Pyramids of Giza and it has also been dubbed as the Scottish Pompeii because of its excellent preservation status. Up to now, this season's journey had brought us to less frequently visited places and we are not used to the masses of visitors here. So, after an informative walk through the visitor centre and the nearby replica house, we decide to give it a miss. On we go to the famous Ring of Brodgar another UNESCO World Heritage Site. This Neolithic henge and stone circle is the only major example in Britain which is almost a perfect circle. As with all these structures, the purpose of the standing stones here at Brodgar is not clear and subject to many theories ranging from astronomical, magical and religious ceremonies. The ring originally comprised up to 60 stones, of which only 27 remain standing today. No doubt, it will have suffered a lot of abuse over time. And, at least for me, the most bizarre example is when the commanders of the famous Gordon's Highlanders Regiment's 9th Battalion thought it was appropriate to use the site for a wee tank driving exercise on the 18th of June 1941. Today, the omnipresent rangers prevent even the slightest attempt to leave the footpath around this impressive monument. Today is open day at the Ness of Brodgar, 
where archaeologists show and explain their work to the public. The Ness of Brodgar is one of the world's most important Neolithic sites. It was discovered in 2003 when the lady who owned the nearby house wanted a wildflower meadow and hired a plowman to prepare the field. The plowman uncovered what looked like the slab of a Bronze Age burial chest. And subsequently, over the years, a vast complex of so far 14 building structures dating as far back as 3300 BC were discovered. Sadly, the lady has been waiting for her wildflower meadow in vain until today and instead has to content herself with a view on a dusty digging site. The last stop on our Neolithic tour brings us to the Stones of Stennis. This may be the oldest hench site on the British Isles. One stone, known as the Odin Stone, was pierced by a circular hole and used by local couples for plighting engagements by holding hands through the gap. There was a reported tradition of making all kinds of oaths or promises with one's hand in the Odin Stone. This was known as taking the vow of Odin. In 1814, Captain W. McKay, a recent immigrant to the Orkneys and new owner of the farmland around the stones, decided to remove them on the grounds that local people were trespassing and disturbing his land by using the stones in rituals. He smashed the Odin stone and after destroying another one, he was stopped only by the public outrage he caused. Join us next time when we leave the Orkneys and sail along the north coast of Scotland to Loch Eribol, around the fearsome Cape Wrath and to the fishing harbour of Kinloch Burwing.